all those involved in this meeting. And thank you, Lord, for that message. It truly is humbling. And should be more humbling. Romans chapter 2 tonight.
should not equate the forbearance of God with his inability or his unwillingness to punish sin. God will, our text says, bring every deed into judgment. One way or another, every man, every woman, every child will stand before a holy God in judgment. They will stand before Him on their own merits or they'll stand before Him in the person of another. God will judge sin. Right. Forbearance manifests His power over Himself. You know, as we think about God being God, being the sovereign, the omnipotent one, the all-powerful one, one, one thing that we see in God as He's revealed Himself, and it is true, that the only thing we know about God in truth is what He's revealed to us. Amen. And God reveals to Him, to us, that He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and that King who has all power at His disposal, first and foremost, has power over Himself. Amen. God controls Himself. And so we find this to be so in the book of Nahum. Back in the Old Testament, in the book of Nahum, we read this in Nahum chapter 1 and verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the, acquit the wicked. He is slow in anger. That is an attribute of God, that God is slow to be brought to anger. And how does He do that? Well, He does it through His own power, His self-control, or as we talk about tonight, His forbearance. The forbearance of God, therefore, is a glorious display of His power over Himself. And it reveals to us that God rules Himself and is not ruled by others. Amen. God's forbearance teaches me that my sin does not rule God, but that God rules over my sin and He'll have His way with me and my sin one way or another on His timing. That's what forbearance teaches me, and that's what it should teach you tonight. God acts on His timetable. God deals with sin and sinners, and He is not, therefore, a reactionary God. God deals according to His grand purpose of things, according to His timetable. And so He has power over Himself. And what I want to look at as we think about the forbearance of God, first of all, let us know that God's forbearance Forbearance is patient forbearance. In our text here in the book of Romans, you'll, you'll see that forbearance and long-suffering are twin uh, attributes of God. And what I mean by that is that they really cannot be separated one from the other. They, they have such characteristics that you cannot uh, easily separate them. The fact is that in the book of Romans, in our text, in Romans chapter 2, it says in verse 4, Or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to the, lead to repentance. God's forbearance and longsuffering are joined together in this text. His forbearance, as we, we noted, is that which him refraining himself or tolerating or enduring, if you will, with sinners. But his long suffering means that he does that a long time. <clears throat> that he is patient with sinners. That he, in, he endures the injury. Uh, you, you might think of it this way. Here's a man, a lost man, and he curses God to his face. It is as if he's one that that's, uh, thumbs his nose at the face of God and says, You will, God, here's your puny man. You're not going to rule over me. You're not going to tell me how to live my right, life. And think about it in this way. Think about someone getting in your face. Like here you are and they get in your face and they come up to you and they spit in your face. And then they slap you a little bit. And then they tell you how bad your children are and how bad your wife is. And they tell you how ugly you are. And they tell you that you stink and that you're good for nothing. That's what man does in a very minute illustration in the face of God. And in all of that, who has power to do whatever he wants to the one doing that to him, he just controls himself. And day after day that goes on. Day after day and moment after moment, years go by, years go by, and God just controls himself. God is patient. God is forbearing. And his forbearance is a patient forbearance. His forbearance is 
long suffering. God's forbearance is also distinct. And by that I mean that it is distinct from other uh, attributes or displays of God's goodness. It should be carefully distinguished from His mercy and His grace. Forbearance, long-suffering, mercy, and grace all display the goodness of God, but they are not one and the same. Amen. It is not God's mercy or His grace. Though it is often coupled in the Scripture with the two, it is not the same thing. Mercy, it has been said, that mercy pities the sinner in his misery. Mercy, it has also been said, is the sinner not getting what he does deserve. Grace, of course, provides the sinner in his misery and ultimately delivers him from his misery. That's what grace does to us. Grace is the sinner getting what he does not deserve. But forbearance is different. Forbearance and long-suffering bears with the sinner within the sin that causes that misery. It bears that sin. It waits. It waits. Forbearance and long-suffering waits to give the sinner what he deserves. Or waits on the sinner to receive God's point of grace. And so as you think about this, I want you to think of it this way. Here's that man. Here's that reprobate, if you will. God does not give grace to the reprobate. But God is patient with the reprobate. God forbears the reprobate. God is long-suffering. We're going to look at that tonight. He's long-suffering with the reprobate. But He doesn't give grace to the reprobate. God's grace is distinct from His forbearance. And we're going to see that, Lord willing, now. Uh, thirdly tonight, and what I really want to deal with, is the forbearance of God is extensive. God forbears with all mankind. No one is exempt from the display of the good forbearance of God. Amen. No one is exempt from how God waits and waits patiently and controls Himself in relationship to the sin and the sinner. And if you're here tonight and you're lost, the reason that you have not already gone to hell is because God has forborne you. Amen. God has waited and God has controlled Himself. This holy God of the Bible that teaches us that you deserve to go to hell tonight. That tonight ought to be your last night. As a matter of fact, the night before that should have been and the night before that. And all your life that you've lived on His earth, you deserve to be pushed off to this place that, that our brother talked about at the end of his message. But God has been long-suffering. God has been forbearing with you. And so it is that His forbearance is extensive. It is not only extensive, beloved, in the sense that it is for the reprobate, but it is also for God's elect. God is so good to us. How often has God uh, sent a messenger? How, listen, beloved, how often have you come to the Lord's house and heard a message preached about a change that ought to be taking place in your life and you go out and commit the same sin that was preached about Sunday morning? You don't even have to wait till Sunday night to come back, but you go on and you do the same thing over and over and over again. How long-suffering and forbearing is our God. Amen. 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 Right. God's forbearance is extensive. As we notice this, we notice that God extends His forbearance toward the reprobate in the book of Romans chapter 9 and verse 22. Romans 9 and verse 22 says, What if God, willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? I want you to notice, first of all, in this text, that God is willing to show His wrath to the reprobate. Amen. God willingly will show His wrath on the reprobate, and it is good that God does show His wrath on the reprobate. The wrath of God, the vengeance of God, is a good thing about God because what it does is magnify His holiness. Sinful man has no control over the wrath of God. You see this in this text. 
What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering? That is, he forbore, he endured. And he did that with much, not just a little bit, but with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And as our text said over there, as we began reading it there in the book of Romans chapter 2, they treasure up, the reprobate treasures up to themselves wrath against the day of wrath. God treasures up His goodness. It's called rich goodness. And that rich goodness has much long suffering and much patience in it. And in contrast to that, man piles himself up wrath for the day of wrath. He thinks that everything's all right in his life. He thinks that he doesn't need God. He doesn't need the goodness of God. He doesn't need the long suffering of God. And he'll even say he doesn't even believe there is a God. But he desperately needs it. And all this time, he's storing up wrath for himself. God controls his wrath, however, and man will have the wrath of God on God's timing according to God's will and for God's purpose. Amen. God controls his wrath. He controls when he'll execute it. You know, in the context of Romans 9, Pharaoh, Pharaoh did not choose uh, to be the king over Egypt. God chose him to be the king right. all over Egypt. And God raised Pharaoh up for this express purpose. And that is that he might make his power known. No, Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey him? The Lord says, well, I'll show you who I am. Not only will I show you who I am, but I'll show the nation of Israel who I am. And not only will I show the nation of Israel who I am, I'll show all the Egyptians who I am. And not only will I show them who I am, I'll show people for thousands of years who I am. Amen. Up to this day, people have heard the story of Pharaoh and how that God drowned him in, in the sea. And so God chooses, God controls. And in all of this, God endures with the reprobate until God's appointed time of wrath. Do not think for a moment, dear sinner, that you can escape the wrath of God on your own. Do not think for a moment that you have sidestepped the wrath of God just because God's been good to you. Amen. Do not think for a moment that you on your own or on your own power or your own might are going to evade the wrath of God. Right. It'll never happen, brother. Yeah. It'll never happen. God waits. God waits for the reprobate. That is, he waits for his time for the reprobate. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3 and verse 20, God's forbearance. As I said, it is not a weakness in God by any stretch of the imagination, though men do imagine that, well, nothing's happened to me yet. And their vain thinking that arises from their sinful heart, they say, well, nothing's happened, and you've heard the jokes, and I actually had a man tell me this before, and others have had it happen, and he, he laughed, and he says, strike me dead right now. And then he wasn't struck dead right then. He said, ah, ha, ha, I see there is no God. Well, God doesn't work on man's timetable. Right? God controls himself. Amen. God waits. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, we see this. 1 Peter 3 and verse 2. The Bible, uh, excuse me, 1 Peter 3 and verse 20 says, Which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God, look at this little verb, wait. Which one... Which once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that, in, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. God waits for the reprobate. He does not wait to see what will happen to the reprobate. That's right. That's right. God doesn't, God's not peeping over a cloud tonight looking down here into this assembly that we're gathered here and saying, now I just wonder what's going to happen to those sinners down there. I wonder which one of them is going to make a move tonight. He wasn't doing that in the Andalusian age. The Bible teaches us that he did wait in the days of Noah, but what did he wait for? He waited for his time of wrath. Amen. He waited also for his time of grace. Yep, yep. God's Long-suffering. 
God is a forbearing God. God knew what he was going to do in Noah's day. Look over there with me in the book of Genesis. It said God waited. His long suffering waited. Uh, his long suffering has uh, patience, if you will. It's all mingled together there. And in the book of Genesis chapter 6 and verse 7, we find that God told Noah what he was going to do. In Genesis chapter 6, we read this in verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For he repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now that doesn't sound like God didn't know what he was going to do. It didn't say that he was waiting to find out what was going to happen either. It teaches us this truth though. It teaches us that God waited and God patiently waited to exercise his power over the reprobate. That's what God's forbearance is about. That's one aspect of it tonight. God, listen beloved, God didn't say, well now Noah, uh, I might not destroy the earth. He didn't say that, did he? Just like we already have in the book of Revelation, we have already been foretold exactly how God's going to destroy this earth. Just like he told Noah what he was going to do, so he has told us what he was going to do. Listen, he's told us how he's going to do it, and he's even laid out a timetable of how it's going to be accomplished. When I say a timetable, I don't mean dates like he's going to do it, you know, in 2017 or 2014 or 2000, you know, or, or, or 30,067. It's not like that. But he lays out an order of things in the book of Revelation as he reveals himself, because it is revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is, it reveals him as the Savior and as the destroyer. It reveals him in his uh, forbearing, long-suffering with uh, his creation. And so God knew what he was going to do in his day. In Noah's day, he knows what he's going to do in our day. He knows that men shall wax worse and worse. And that they will heap to themselves teachers having engineers. And that they will day after day store for themselves wrath against the day of wrath. And so what he's doing is just waiting for man to fill up his measure of wrath. In the forbearance of God. And then God extends his forbearance not only to the reprobate, but he extends it toward his people. Thank God that he was long suffering and patient with me in the book of the second, and it still is. Yeah. In the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, we read that Paul was an example of this. The Apostle Paul was not, beloved, he didn't come on this earth a saved man. He didn't come on this earth as a righteous man. Nobody does. And he is an example for us of God's long suffering with his elect people. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 16, the Bible says, How be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now, here is an encouragement for you, your sinner, if you're here today. You're still here. So how can I know whether I'm one of God's elect? Well, I'll tell you how you can know. Here's one way to know. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm saying. To trust in the substitute that God has provided. To believe that God is righteous. And that he is righteous when he says that you are a sinner. And that you need a savior. Paul is a pattern of that. Paul says, you see, Paul was a great sinner and, and Paul kicked against the pricks and, and Paul sinned greatly against God. And even though he was a religious man outwardly, he was a lost man inwardly. And Paul says here that, that I might be, that God might show his long suffering and that would be a pattern, a pattern for to them which should hereafter believe on him to life. Eternal. Amen. God dealt with Paul in forbearance as he would go into the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ and he would kill men and he would kill women or at least have them sentenced to death. 
uh, as he gave the thumbs down to that great man of God, Stephen, and says, yes, kill him, go ahead and do away with him. When he would stop his ears as the others uh, had stiff neck, yet God was long-suffering and forbearing. And you may be here a great sinner. No doubt you are a great sinner, whether you believe it or not. You may have cussed God. You may have taken His name in vain. You may have broken all kinds of commandments in many different ways. There may be sins in your life that are deep and vast, far that I, that I would know about or others would know about here. But you're still here. Which shows me that God is forbearing and long-suffering. God's forbearance is the elect salvation. We read this over in the book of First, Second Peter, chapter three. Second Peter, chapter three, and verse five, and verse. Uh, Verse 15. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. God is long suffering. It is in God's appointed time that he saved the apostle Paul. It is in God's appointed time that He does save sinners from their sin. He uses great means to accomplish this. The first and foremost means is the death of His Son. God sent His Son. You know, the Bible says over there in Romans, just a little bit further on, that were passed, talking about sins, that were passed through the forbearance of God. The reason that God did not destroy, one reason, there are many reasons, but one reason that God did not destroy His creation from the beginning was because he is forbearing. And he waited for that day that his son would come and be born. For 4,000 years of human history, he waited and waited until his appointed time and the virgin conceived with child and, she, and, he, and Jesus Christ. And he waited all the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he waited to the cross. He waited, showing that it is his salvation for his people. God waits for the fullness of His plan to come to pass. And so in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. Not willing that any should perish, that is, any of us, but that all, that is, all of us should come to repentance. God is willing that every one of his dear children come to repentance and they will. Amen. They will come to repentance. Amen. Now if you've never repented of your sins and you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer to you is, is that you would see what Brother Sam spoke about tonight and, and that is the holiness of God. And see yourself the sinner you, you are and see God and His goodness. See how good God has been to you by waiting. By the way, may God bless you is my prayer. And may you come to see that you need a Savior and that you're desperate to walk without the Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.